Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 29 Relief of the Holy Souls, Alms It remains for us to speak of the last and very powerful means of relieving the poor souls, viz. almsgiving. The angelic doctor, St. Thomas, gives the preference to alms before fasting and prayer when there is a question of expiating past faults. Almsgiving, he says, possesses more completely the virtue of satisfaction than prayer, and prayer more completely than fasting. This is why the great servants of God and the greatest saints have chosen it as a principal means of assisting the dead. Amongst them, we may mention as one of the most remarkable, the holy abbot Raven Maur, first abbot of Fluda, in the 10th century, and afterwards Archbishop of Mainz. Father Tritimus, a well-known writer of the Order of St. Benedict, caused abundant alms to be distributed for the dead. He had an established rule that whenever a religious died, the portion of food should be distributed among the poor for thirty days, that the soul may be released by the alms. It happened in the year 830 that the monastery of Faluda was attacked by a contagious disease which carried off a large number of the religious. Reben Maur, full of zeal and charity for their souls, called Eldred, the park creator of the monastery, and reminded him of the rule established regarding the alms of the departed. Take great care, he said, that our constitutions be faithfully observed, and that the poor be fed for a whole month with the food destined for the brethren we have lost. Idilard failed both in obedience and charity, under pretext that such liberality was extravagant, and he must economize the resources of the monastery. But in reality, because he was influenced by a secret avarice, he neglected to distribute the food, or did so in a manner far short of the command he had received. God did not leave this disobedience unpunished. A month lapsed when one evening after the community had retired, he walked across the chapter room with a lamp in his hand. What was his astonishment when, at the hour that the room should have been unoccupied, he found there a great number of religious? His astonishment turned into fear when, looking at them attentively, he recognized the religious lately deceased. Terror seized him, and an icy coldness ran through his veins, and riveted him to the spot like a lifeless statue. Then one of the dead brothers addressed him with terrible reproaches. Unfortunate creature, he said, why didst you not distribute the alms which were destined to give relief to the souls of thy departed brethren? Why hast thou deprived us of the assistance amid the torments of purgatory? Receive from this moment the punishment of thy avarice. Another and more terrible chastisement is reserved for thee, when after three days you shall appear before thy God. At these words Eliard fell as though struck by a thunderbolt, and remained unmovable until after midnight, at the hour when the community went to choir. There they found him half dead, in the same condition as was Heliodorus of old, after he had been scourged by the angels in the temple of Jerusalem. He was carried to the infirmary, with all possible care, was lavished upon him, so that he recovered consciousness. As soon as he was able to speak, in the presence of the abbot and all his brethren, he related with tears the terrible occurrence to which his sad condition but too evidently bore witness. Then adding that he was to die within three days, he asked for the last sacraments, with all signs of humble repentance. He received them with sentiments of piety, and three days later expired, assisted by the prayers of his brethren. Mass for the dead was immediately sung, and his share of food was distributed to the poor for the benefit of his soul. Meanwhile, his punishment was not at an end. Idilard appeared to Abbot Raven pale and disfigured. Touched with compassion, Raven inquired what he could do for him. Ah, replied the unfortunate soul, notwithstanding the prayers of our holy community, I cannot obtain the grace of my deliverance until all my brethren, 
whom my avarice defrauded of the suffrages due to them, had been released. That which has been given to the poor for me has been of no profit but to them, and this by order of divine justice. I entreat you, therefore, O venerated and merciful Father, redouble your alms. I hope that by these powerful means divine clemency will vouchsafe to deliver us all, my brethren first, and afterwards myself, who am the least deserving of mercy. Raven Maurer increased his alms, and scarcely had another month elapsed, when Idilard then appeared, but clad in white, surrounded rays of light, and his countenance beaming with joy. He thanked in the most touching manner his abbot and all the members of his monastery for the charity exercised towards him. What instruction does not this history contain? In the first place, the virtue of almsgiving for the dead shines forth in a most striking manner. Then we see how God chastises, even in this life, those who through avarice fear not to deprive the dead of their suffrages. I speak not here of those heirs who render themselves culpable by neglecting to make the endowments which devolve upon them by last will and testament of their deceased relatives, a negligence which constitutes a sacrilegious injustice, but of those children or relatives who, through miserable motives of interest, have as few masses as possible celebrated as sparing in the distribution of alms, having no pity for the souls of their departed relatives, which they leave to languish in the horrible torments of purgatory. It is the blackest ingratitude, a hardness of heart entirely opposed to Christian charity, and which will meet its punishment perhaps even in this world. Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 30 Relief of the Holy Souls, Almsgiving, Christian Mercy Christian Almsgiving that mercy which Jesus Christ so much recommends in the gospel comprises not only corporal assistance given to the needy, but also the good we do for our neighbor by working for his salvation, supporting his defects, and pardoning his offenses. All these works of charity may be offered to God for the dead and contain great satisfactory virtue. St. Francis de Sales relates that at Padua, where he pursued part of his studies, there existed a detestable custom. The young men amused themselves by running through the streets at night armed with arquebuses and crying out to those they meet, Who goes there? People were obliged to answer, for they fired upon those who gave no reply, and many persons were thus wounded or killed. It happened one evening that a student, not having responded to the question, was struck in the head by a ball and mortally wounded. The perpetrator of this deed, seized with terror, took to flight and sought refuge in the house of a good widow whom he knew, and whose son was his fellow student. He confessed to her with tears that he just killed someone unknown to him, and begged her to give him as an asylum in her house. Touched with compassion and not suspecting that she had before her the murderer of her son, the lady concealed the fugitive in a place of safety where the officers of justice would be unable to discover him. Half an hour had not elapsed when a tumultuous noise was heard at the door. A corpse was carried in the place before the eyes of a widow. Alas, it was her son who had been killed and whose murderer now lay concealed in her house. The poor mother broke forth into heart-rending cries in entering the hiding place of the assassin. Miserable man, she said, what hath my son done to you that you should thus cruelly have murdered him? The guilty wretch learned that he had killed his friend, cried aloud, tearing his hair and wringing his hands in despair. Then throwing himself upon his knees, he asked pardon of his protectress, and besought her to deliver him up to the magistrate, that he might expiate so horrible a crime. The disconsolate mother remembered at that moment that she was a Christian, the example of Jesus Christ, praying for his executioners, 
stimulated her to an heroic action. She replied that provided he asked pardon of God and amend his life, she would let him go and stay all legal proceedings against him. This pardon was so agreeable to God that he wished to give this generous mother a striking proof thereof. He permitted that the soul of her son should appear to her resplendent with glory, seeing that he was about to enjoy eternal beatitude. God has shown mercy to me, dear mother, said the blessed soul, because you showed mercy towards my assassin. In consideration of the pardon which you granted, I have been delivered from purgatory, where, without the assistance which you have offered me, I should have had to undergo long years of intense sufferings. Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 31 Relief of the Holy Souls The Heroic Act of Charity Towards the Holy Souls Thus far we have spoken of the different kinds of good works which we may offer to God as suffrages for the dead. It remains for us to make known an act which comprises all works and means, whereby we can most effectually assist the poor souls. It is the heroic vow, or, as others call it, the heroic act of charity towards the souls in purgatory. This act consists in ceding to them all our works of satisfaction, that is to say, the satisfactory value of all the works of our life, and of all the suffrages which will be given to us after our death, without reserving anything wherewith to discharge our own debts. We deposit them in the hands of the Blessed Virgin, that she may distribute them, according to her good pleasure, to those souls who she desires to deliver from purgatory. It is an absolute donation in favor of the souls of all that we can give to them. We offer to God in their behalf all the good works we do, of what kind soever, either in thought, word, or deed, all that we suffer meritoriously during this life, without accepting anything that we may reasonably give them, and aiding them those suffrages which we receive for ourselves after death. It must be well understood that the matter of this holy donation is the satisfactory value of our works, and in no way the merit which has a corresponding degree of glory in heaven, for merit is strictly personal and cannot be transferred to another. The Formula of the Heroic Act O holy and adorable Trinity, desiring to cooperate in the deliverance of the souls in purgatory, and to testify my devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, I cede and renounce in my behalf of those holy souls all the satisfactory part of my works, and all the suffrages which may be given to me after my death, consigning them entirely into the hands of the Most Blessed Virgin, that she may apply them according to her good pleasure to those souls of the faithfully departed whom she desires to deliver from their sufferings. Design, O my God, to accept and bless this offering which I make to thee at this moment. Amen. The Sovereign Pontiffs, Benedict the Thirteenth, Pius the Sixth, and Pius the Ninth, have approved this heroic act, and have enriched it with indulgences and privileges, of which the principal are the following. First, to priests who have made this act the indult of a privileged altar every day in the year. Second, the simple faithful can gain a plenary indulgence, applicable to the souls in purgatory only, each time they communicate, provided they visit a church or a public oratory, and there pray for the intention of His Holiness. Third, they may apply to the holy souls all those indulgences which are not otherwise applicable to the virtue of concession, and which have been granted up to the present time, or which shall be granted in the future. I advise to all Christians, says Father Mumford, to cede with holy disinterestedness to the faithful departed all the fruit of their good works, which are at our disposal. I do not believe that they can be made a better use of them, since they render them more meritorious and more efficacious, as well as obtaining grace from God, 
as for expiating their own sins and shortening the term of their purgatory, or even acquiring an entire exemption therefrom. These words express the precious advantages of the heroic act, and in order to dissipate all subsequent fear which might arise in the mind, we have three remarks. First, this act leaves us perfect liberality to pray for those souls in whom we are most interested. The application of these prayers is subject to the disposition of the adorable will of God, which is always infinitely perfect and infinitely loving. Second, it does not oblige under pain of mortal sin and can be at any time be revoked. It may be made without using any particular formula. It suffices to have the intention and to make it from the heart. Nevertheless, it is useful to recite the formula of offering from time to time in order to stimulate our zeal for the relief of the holy souls by prayer, penances, and good works. Third, the heroic act does not subject us to the direful consequences of having to undergo a long purgatory ourselves. On the contrary, it allows us to rely with more assured confidence in the mercy of God in our regard, as is shown by the example of St. Gertrude. Venerable Dennis, the Carthusian, relates that the Virgin, St. Gertrude, had made a complete donation of all her works of satisfaction in favor of the faithful departed, without reserving anything wherewith to discharge the debts which she herself might have contracted in the sight of God. Being at the point of death, and like all the saints, considered with much sorrow the great number of her sins on the one hand, and on the other remembering that she had employed all her works of satisfaction for the expiation of the sins of others. She was afflicted lest having given all to others, and reserved nothing for herself, her soul under the departure of this world should be condemned to her horrible sufferings. In the midst of her fears, our Lord appeared to her and consoled her, saying, Be reassured, my daughter. Your charity towards the departed will be no detriment to you. Know that the generous donation you have made of all your works to the holy souls have been singularly pleasing to me. And to give you proof thereof, I declare to you that all the pains you would have had to endure in the other life are now remitted. Moreover, in recompense of your generous charity, I will so enhance the value of the merits of your works as to give you a great increase of glory in heaven.